The text for this morning's meditation is from Luke 4, verses 1 through 13, on the theme of identity. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan after his baptism and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tested by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in, in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve only him. Then the devil led him to Jerusalem, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. May God bless this reading of the word. In recent years, we've been hearing warnings about the growing problem of deep fakes. Seems almost every week there's something in the news about that. Deep fakes use artificial intelligence to replace the likeness or the voice of one person with another in video and audio. And there are growing concerns that deep fakes can be used to create fake news and misleading videos. We are confronted with the question, what is for real and what is deceptive? In the temptation experience, the devil confronted Jesus with the question, who are you? If you are the Son of God, the devil whispered, it was as though the tempter was demanding that Jesus show his identification. If. Most English translations render the Greek word as if, while a few others use since instead. In either case, the question is put to Jesus, what does it mean to be the Son of God? What kind of savior will you be? And Jesus answers each of the temptations by addressing a different, more fundamental question, whose are we? Though hungry, he would not turn desert stones to bread because he knew that human beings do not live by bread alone. We are meant to live by the word of God, our creator. And Jesus would not stoop to the ways of the rich and powerful in our world to amass political power. Though he came to save humanity, he knew that when the world goes low, God's Son must go high. Worship the Lord your God and serve only Him, he said. And the third temptation represented our all-too-human desire to force God's hand to do our will rather than the other way around. Jesus, just jump off the building and let the angels catch you. In 1987, the famous televangelist Earl Roberts shut himself up in a tower and he told the public that he, unless he raised a certain large sum of money by a given date, God would take his life. And some donors, alarmed by the tone of this communication were worried that Roberts intended to harm himself. And although his projects over the years had produced some good results, this sensationalist fundraising method seemed to many people to draw attention away from the God 
that Oral Roberts sought to serve. At its heart, it was an attempt to force God's hand to do Robert's will. Just jump off the building and the angels will catch you. In his temptation experience in the wilderness, Jesus confronted three forks in his road. And in each case, he said no to one direction and yes to another. <coughs> do you remember the very popular game show to tell the truth? that began in 1956 on the CBS television network. It ran for many years in various formats and on different networks since that time. The original version involved a central character with an interesting backstory of some kind and two imposters. The central character in each round of play was obligated to tell the truth to any questions that were posed to him. But the imposters would try to fool the celebrity panel of four by lying. The panelists would each ask questions of the three contestants. Number one, did you... Number three, have you ever... As time ran out for that round, the panelists would vote for the contestant whom they believed to be the real John Smith or the true Jane Doe. And it wasn't often easy to tell which man or woman was truly the person she or he claimed to be. Who was for real and who was an imposter? And then the moment of truth came at the end as the host said, will the real Jane Doe please stand up? And then the truth was revealed. We know that the stakes are often higher in real life. For example, when nominees for high office appear before a Senate confirmation committee, we sometimes learn that there is a question as to whether the nominee's public persona and private behavior actually line up as we're presented with differing descriptions of the character of this nominee. Naturally, the question is raised in people's minds, which is the real person? In a crisis, which person is likely to emerge and to make the crucial and sensitive decisions that need to be made? We know that people in our country no longer feel pressured to attend worship regularly, and the portion of the population that claims no religious affiliation has been rising over the past several decades. But that does not mean that there is no interest in spiritual matters. Many people in our country, in fact, are watching to see if the Christian life is for real. In 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul warned the Corinthians about religion that appeared one way on the outside but was something else on the inside. And so he started off, if I speak in the tongues of humans and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And he goes on from there in the first three verses. And then in verses 4 through 7, although as though he were holding up a mirror before our faces, he asks, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It can be a humbling exercise to substitute our own names wherever the word love appears. David is patient. David is kind. David is not envious or boastful. Well, you get the idea. This congregation was founded in 1711 by people who were committed to a consecrated life, a life of people who were believers. And they had subscribed to many of the Baptist principles, the things that make up Baptist identification. 
They believed that they should be guided primarily by scripture, for example, rather than by creeds or by hierarchy. So they were branded troublemakers. And when they first began in the 17th century, some of those early Baptists were accused of child abuse because they did not baptize their infants. What kind of church do we want to be now in the 21st century? In his temptation ordeal, Jesus was challenged with the question, who are you? He was able to meet that challenge because he remembered whose he was and why he was there. Following in Christ's footsteps, may we live out the words of this familiar hymn in all that we do as a church and as individual Christians this year. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We pray that all unity may one day be restored. We will work with each other, we will work side by side, and we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand, and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. Amen.